Story 192 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Master Thief. One day, an old man and his wife were sitting in front of a miserable house resting a while from their work. Suddenly, a splendid carriage with four black horses came driving up, and a richly dressed man descended from it. The peasant stood up, went to the great man, and asked what he wanted, and in what way he could be useful to him. The stranger stretched out his hand to the old man, and said, I want nothing but to enjoy for once a country dish. Cook me some potatoes, in the way you always have them, and then I will sit down at your table and eat them with pleasure. The peasant smiled and said, You are a count, or a prince, or perhaps even a duke. Noble gentlemen often have such fancies, but you shall have your wish. The wife went into the kitchen and began to wash and rub the potatoes, and to make them into balls, as they are eaten by the country folks. Whilst she was busy with this work, the peasant said to the stranger, Come into my garden with me for a while. I have still something to do there. He had dug some holes in the garden, and now wanted to plant some trees in them. Have you no children? asked the stranger, who could help you with your work. No, answered the peasant. I had a son, it is true, but it is long since he went out into the world. He was a ne'er-do-well, sharp and knowing, but he would learn nothing and was full of bad tricks. At last he ran away from me, and since then I have heard nothing of him. The old man took a young tree, put it in a hole, drove in a post beside it, and when he had shoveled in some earth and had trampled it firmly down, he tied the stem of the tree above, below, and in the middle fast to the post by a rope of straw. But tell me, said the stranger, why you don't tie that crooked knotted tree, which is lying in the corner there, bent down almost to the ground, to a post also, that it may grow straight as well as these? The old man smiled and said, Sir, you speak according to your knowledge. It is easy to see that you are not familiar with gardening. That tree there is old and misshapen. No one can make it straight now. Trees must be trained while they are young. That is how it was with your son, said the stranger. If you had trained him while he was still young, he would not have run away. Now he too must have grown hard and misshapen. Truly, it is a long time since he went away, replied the old man. He must have changed. Would you know him again if he were to come to you? asked the stranger. Hardly by his face, replied the peasant, but he has a mark about him, a birthmark on his shoulder that looks like a bean. When he had said that, the stranger pulled off his coat, bared his shoulder, and showed the peasant the bean. Good God, cried the old man, thou art really my son, and love for his child stirred in his heart. But, he added, how canst thou be my son? Thou hast become a great lord, and livest in wealth and luxury. How hast thou contrived to do that? Ah, father, answered the son, the young tree was bound to no post and has grown crooked. Now it is too old. It will never be straight again. How have I got all that? I have become a thief. But do not be alarmed. I am a master thief. For me, there are neither locks nor bolts. Whatsoever I desire is mine. Do not imagine that I steal like a common thief. I only take some of the superfluity of the rich. Poor people are safe. I would rather give to them than take anything from them. It is the same with anything which I can have without trouble, cunning, and dexterity. I never touch it. Alas, my son, said the father, it still does not please me. A thief is still a thief. I tell thee, it will end badly. 
he took him to his mother, and when she heard that was her son, she wept for joy. But when he told her that he had become a master thief, two streams flowed down over her face. At length she said, Even if he has become a thief, he is still my son, and my eyes have beheld him once more. They sat down to table, and once again he ate with his parents the wretched food which he had not eaten for so long. The father said, If our lord, the count up there in the castle, learns who thou art, and what trade thou followest, he will not take thee in his arms and cradle thee in them, as he did when he held thee at the font, but will cause thee to swing from a halter. Be easy, father, he will do me no harm, for I understand my trade. I will go to him myself this very day. When evening drew near, the master thief seated himself in his carriage and drove to the castle. The count received him civilly, for he took him for a distinguished man. When, however, the stranger made himself known, the count turned pale and was quite silent for some time. At length he said, Thou art my godson, and on that account mercy shall take the place of justice, and I will deal leniently with thee. Since thou pridest thyself on being a master thief, I will put thy art to the proof. But if thou dost not stand the test, thou must marry the rope-maker's daughter, and the croaking of the raven must be thy music on the occasion. Lord Count, answered the master thief, think of three things, as difficult as you like, and if I do not perform your tasks, do with me what you will. The Count reflected for some minutes, and then said, Well, then, in the first place, thou shalt steal the horse I keep for my own riding, out of the stable. In the next, thou shalt steal the sheet from beneath the bodies of my wife and myself when we are asleep, without our observing it, and the wedding ring of my wife as well. Thirdly, and lastly, thou shalt steal away out of the church the parson and clerk. Mark what I am saying, for thy life depends on it. The master thief went to the nearest town. There he bought the clothes of an old peasant woman and put them on. Then he stained his face brown and painted wrinkles on it as well, so that no one could have recognized him. Then he filled a small cask with old hungry wine, in which was mixed a powerful sleeping drink. He put the cask in a basket, which he took on his back, and walked with slow and tottering steps to the Count's castle. It was already dark when he arrived. He sat down on a stone in the courtyard, and began to cough like an asthmatic old woman, and to rub his hands as if he were cold. In front of the door of the stable, some soldiers were lying round a fire. One of them observed the woman, and called out to her. Come nearer, old mother, and warm thyself beside us. After all, thou hast no bed for the night, and must take one where thou canst find it. The old woman tottered up to them, begged them to lift the basket from her back, and sat down beside them at the fire. What hast thou gotten thy little cask, old lady? asked one. A good mouthful of wine, she answered. I live by trade. For money and fair words, I am quite ready to let you have a glass. Let us have it here, then, said the soldier. And when he had tasted one glass, he said, When wine is good, I like another glass, and had another poured out for himself, and the rest followed his example. Hello, comrades, cried one of them to those who were in the stable. Here is an old goody who has wine that is as old as herself, Take a draught. It will warm your stomachs far better than our fire. The old woman carried her cask into the stable. One of the soldiers had seated himself on the saddled riding horse. Another held its bridle in his hand. A third had laid hold of its tail. She poured out as much as they wanted until the spring ran dry. It was not long before the bridle fell from the hand of the one, and he fell down and began to snore. The other left hold of the tail, lay down, and snored still louder. 
the one who was sitting in the saddle did remain sitting, but bent his head almost down to the horse's neck, and slept and blew with his mouth like the bellows of a forge. The soldiers outside had already been asleep for a long time, and were lying on the ground motionless, as if dead. When the master thief saw that he had succeeded, he gave the first a rope in his hand instead of the bridle, and the other, who had been holding the tail, a wisp of straw. But what was he to do with the one who was sitting on the horse's back? He did not want to throw him down, for he might have awakened and have uttered a cry. He had a good idea. He unbuckled the girds of the saddle, tied a couple of ropes which were hanging to a ring on the wall fast to the saddle, and drew the sleeping rider up into the air on it. Then he twisted the rope round the posts and made it fast. He soon unloosed the horse from the chain, but if he had ridden over the stony pavement of the yard, they would have heard the noise in the castle. So he wrapped the horse's hooves in old rags, led him carefully out, leapt upon him, and galloped off. When day broke, the master galloped to the castle on the stolen horse. The count had just got up, and was looking out of the window. "'Good morning, Sir Count,' he cried to him. "'Here is the horse, which I have got safely out of the stable. Just look how beautifully your soldiers are lying there sleeping. And if you will but go into the stable, you will see how comfortable your watchers have made it for themselves.' The count could not help laughing. Then he said, for once thou hast succeeded, but things won't go so well the second time, and I warn thee that if thou comest before me as a thief, I will handle thee as I would a thief. When the countess went to bed that night, she closed her hand with the wedding ring tightly together, and the count said, All the doors are locked and bolted. I will keep awake and wait for the thief. But if he gets in by the window, I will shoot him. The master thief, however, went in the dark to the gallows, cut a poor sinner who was hanging there down from the halter, and carried him on his back to the castle. Then he set a ladder up to the bedroom, put the dead body on his shoulders, and began to climb up. When he had got so high that the head of the dead man showed at the window, the count, who was watching in his bed, fired a pistol at him, and immediately the master let the poor sinner fall down and hid himself in one corner. The night was sufficiently lighted by the moon for the master to see distinctly how the count got out of the window, onto the ladder, came down, carried the dead body into the garden, and began to dig a hole in which to lay it. Now, thought the thief, the favorable moment has come, stole nimbly out of his corner, and climbed up the ladder straight into the countess's bedroom. Dear wife, he began in the count's voice, the thief is dead, but after all, he is my godson, and has been more of a scapegrace than a villain. I will not put him to open shame. Besides, I am sorry for the parents. I will bury him myself before daybreak, in the garden, that the thing may not be known. So give me the sheet, I will wrap up the body in it, and bury him as a dog buries things by scratching. The countess gave him the sheet. I tell you what, continued the thief, I have a fit of magnanimity on me. Give me the ring, too. The unhappy man risked his life for it, so he may take it with him into his grave. She would not gainsay the count, and although she did it unwillingly, she drew the ring from her finger and gave it to him. The thief made off with both these things and reached home safely before the count in the garden had finished his work of burying. What a long face the count did pull when the master came next morning, and brought him the sheet and the ring. Art thou a wizard? said he. Who has fetched thee out of the grave in which I myself laid thee, and brought thee to life again? You did not bury me, said the thief, but the poor sinner on the gallows. And he told him exactly how everything had happened, and the count was forced to own to him, that he was a clever, crafty thief. But thou hast not reached the end yet, he added. Thou hast still to perform the third task, and if thou dost not succeed in that, all is of no use. The master smiled and returned no answer. 
When night had fallen, he went with a long sack on his back, a bundle under his arms, and a lantern in his hand to the village church. In the sack he had some crabs, and in the bundle short wax candles. He sat down in the churchyard, took out a crab, and stuck a wax candle on his back. Then he lighted the little light, put the crab on the ground, and let it creep about. He took a second out of the sack, and treated it in the same way, and so on until the last was out of the sack. Hereupon he put on a long black garment that looked like a monk's cowl, and stuck a grey beard on his chin. When at last he was quite unrecognizable, he took the sack in which the crabs had been, went into the church, and ascended the pulpit. The clock in the tower was just striking twelve. When the last stroke had sounded, he cried with a loud and piercing voice, Hearken, sinful men! The end of all things has come. The last day is at hand. Hearken, hearken! Whosoever wishes to go to heaven with me must creep into the sack. I am Peter, who opens and shuts the gate of heaven. Behold how the dead outside there in the churchyard are wandering about collecting their bones. Come, come, and creep into the sack. The world is about to be destroyed. The cry echoed through the whole village. The parson and clerk who lived nearest to the church heard it first, and when they saw the lights which were moving about the churchyard, they observed that something unusual was going on, and went into the church. They listened to the sermon for a while, and then the clerk nudged the parson and said, It would not be amiss if we were to use the opportunity together, and before the dawning of the last day find an easy way of getting to heaven. To tell the truth, answered the parson, that is what I myself have been thinking, so if you are inclined, we will set out on our way. Yes, answered the clerk, but you, the pastor, have the precedence. I will follow. So the parson went first and ascended the pulpit where the master opened his sack. The parson crept in first and then the clerk. The master immediately tied up the sack tightly, seized it by the middle, and dragged it down the pulpit steps. And whenever the heads of the two fools bumped against the steps, he cried, We are going over the mountains. Then he drew them through the village in the same way, and when they were passing through puddles, he cried, Now we are going through wet clouds. And when at last he was dragging them up the steps of the castle, he cried, Now we are on the steps of heaven, and will soon be in the outer court. When he had got to the top, he pushed the sack into the pigeon house, and when the pigeons fluttered about, he said, Hark how glad the angels are, and how they are flapping their wings. Then he bolted the door upon them and went away. Next morning he went to the count and told him that he had performed the third task also, and had carried the parson and clerk out of the church. Where hast thou left them? asked the Lord. They are lying upstairs in a sack in the pigeon house, and imagine that they are in heaven. The count went up himself and convinced himself that the master had told the truth. When he had delivered the parson and clerk from their captivity, he said, Thou art an arch-thief, and hast won thy wager. For once thou escapest with a whole skin, but see that thou leavest my land, for if ever thou settest foot on it again, thou mayst count on thy elevation to the gallows. The arch-thief took leave of his parents, once more went forth into the wide world, and no one has ever heard of him since. End of 192 Story 193 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kurt from Tucson, Arizona. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm and translated by Margaret Hunt. The Drummer. A young drummer went out alone one evening into the country, and came to a lake on the shore of which he perceived three pieces of white linen lying. What fine linen, said he, 
and put one piece in his pocket. He returned home, thought no more of what he had found, and went to bed. Just as he was going to sleep, it seemed to him as if someone was saying his name. He listened, and was aware of a soft voice which cried to him, Drummer, drummer, wake up. As it was a dark night, he could see no one, but it appeared to him that a figure was hovering above his bed. "'What do you want?' he asked. "'Give me back my dress,' answered the voice, "'that you took away from me last evening by the lake.' "'You shall have it back again,' said the drummer, "'if you will tell me who you are.' "'Ah,' replied the voice, "'I am the daughter of a mighty king.' but I have fallen into the power of a witch, and am shut up on the glass mountain. I have to bathe in the lake every day with my two sisters, but I cannot fly back again without my dress. My sisters have gone away, but I have been forced to stay behind. I entreat you to give me my dress back. Be easy, poor child, said the drummer. I will willingly give it back to you. He took it out of his pocket, and reached it to her in the dark. She snatched it in haste, and wanted to go away with it. Stop a moment, perhaps I can help you. You can only help me by ascending the glass mountain, and freeing me from the power of the witch. But you cannot come to the glass mountain, and indeed if you were quite close to it, you could not ascend it. When I want to do a thing, I always can do it, said the drummer. I am sorry for you, and have no fear of anything, but I do not know the way which leads to the glass mountain. The road goes through the great forest, in which the man-eaters live, she answered, and more than that I dare not tell you. And then he heard her wings quiver, and she flew away. By daybreak the drummer arose, buckled on his drum, and went without fear straight into the forest. After he had walked for a while, without seeing any giants, he thought to himself, I must waken up the sluggards. And he hung his drum before him, and beat such a reveille that the birds flew out of the trees with loud cries. It was not long before a giant, who had been lying sleeping among the grass, rose up, and was as tall as a fir tree. Wretch, cried he, what art thou drumming here for, and wakening me out of my best sleep? I am drumming, he replied, because I want to show the way to many thousands who are following me. What do they want in my forest? demanded the giant. They want to put an end to thee, and cleanse the forest of such a monster as thou art. Oh, said the giant, I will trample you all to death like so many ants. Dost thou think thou canst do anything against us? said the drummer. If thou stoopest, take hold of one, he will jump away and hide himself. But when thou art lying down and sleeping, they will come forth from every thicket and creep up to thee. Every one of them has a hammer of steel in his belt, and with that they will beat in thy skull. The giant grew angry and thought, If I meddle with the crafty folk, it might turn out badly for me. I can strangle wolves and bears, but I cannot protect myself from these earthworms. Listen, little fellow, said he, go back again, and I will promise thee that for the future I will leave thee and thy comrades in peace, and if there is anything else thou wishest for, tell me, for I am quite willing to do something to please thee. Thou hast long legs, said the drummer, and canst run quicker than I. Carry me to the glass mountain, and I will give my followers a signal to go back, and they shall leave thee in peace this time. Come here, worm, said the giant. Seat thyself on my shoulder. I will carry thee where thou wishest to be. The giant lifted him up, and the drummer began to beat his drum up aloft to his heart's delight. The giant thought, that is the signal for the other people to turn back. After a while a second giant was standing in the road, who took the drummer from the first, and stuck him in his own buttonhole. The drummer laid hold of the button, which was as large as a dish, held on by it, and looked merrily around. 
then they came to a third giant who took him out of the buttonhole and set him on the rim of his hat then the drummer walked backwards and forwards up above and looked over the trees and when he perceived a mountain in the blue distance he thought that must be the glass mountain and so it was the giant only made two steps more and they reached the foot of the mountain when the giant put him down the drummer demanded to be put on the summit of the glass mountain but the giant shook his head growled something in his beard and went back into the forest and now the poor drummer was standing before the mountain which was as high as if three mountains were piled on each other and at the same time as smooth as a looking-glass and did not know how to get up it he began to climb but that was useless for he always slipped back again if one were a bird now thought he but what was the good of wishing no wings grew for him while he was standing thus not knowing what to do he saw not far from him two men who were struggling fiercely together he went up to them and saw they were disputing about a saddle which was lying on the ground before them and which both of them wanted to have what fools you are said he to quarrel about a saddle when you have not a horse for it the saddle is worth fighting about answered one of the men whosoever sits on it and wishes himself in any place even if it should be the very end of the earth gets there the instant he has uttered the wish the saddle belongs to us in common it is my turn to ride on it but that other man will not let me do it i will soon decide the quarrel said the drummer and he went a short distance and stuck a white rod in the ground then he came back and said now run to the goal and whoever gets there first shall ride first both put themselves into a trot but hardly had they gone a couple of steps before the drummer swung himself on the saddle wished himself on the glass mountain and before anyone could turn round he was there on the top of the mountain was a plain there stood an old stone house and in front of the house lay a great fish pond but behind it was a dark forest he saw neither men nor animals everything was quiet only the wind rustled among the trees and the clouds moved by quite close above his head he went to the door and knocked when he had knocked for the third time an old woman with a brown face and red eyes opened the door she had spectacles on her long nose and looked sharply at him then she asked what he wanted entrance food and a bed for the night replied the drummer that thou shalt have said the old woman if thou wilt perform three services in return why not he answered i am not afraid of any kind of work however hard it may be the old woman let him go in and gave him some food and a good bed at night the next morning when he had had his sleep out she took a thimble from her wrinkled finger reached it to the drummer and said go to work now and empty out the pond with this thimble but thou must have it done before night and must have sought all the fishes which are in the water and laid them side by side according to their kind and size that is strange work said the drummer but he went to the pond and began to empty it he bailed the whole morning but what can any one do to a great lake with a thimble even if he were to bail for a thousand years when it was noon he thought it is all useless and whether i work or not it will come to the same thing so he gave it up and sat down then came a maiden out of the house who set a basket with food before him and said what ails thee that thou sittest so sadly here he looked at her and saw she was wondrously beautiful ah said he i cannot finish the first piece of work how will it be with the others i came forth to seek a king's daughter who is said to dwell here but i have not found her and i will go farther stay here said the maiden i will help thee out of thy difficulty thou art tired lay thy head on my lap and sleep when thou awakest again thy work will be done the drummer did not need to be told that twice as soon as his eyes were shut she turned a wishing ring and said rise water fishes come out instantly the water rose on high like a white mist and moved away with the other clouds and the fishes sprang on the shore and laid themselves side by side each according to his size and kind 
When the drummer awoke, he saw with amazement that all was done. But the maiden said, One of the fish is not lying with those of its own kind, but quite alone. When the old woman comes tonight and sees that all she demanded has been done, she will ask thee, What is this fish lying alone for? Then throw the fish in her face and say, This one shall be for thee, old witch. In the evening the witch came, and when she had put this question, he threw the fish in her face. She behaved as if she did not remark it, and said nothing but looked at him with malicious eyes. Next morning she said, Yesterday it was too easy for thee, I must give thee harder work. Today thou must hew down the whole of the forest, split the wood into logs, and pile them up, and everything must be finished by the evening. She gave him an axe, a mallet, and two wedges. But the axe was made of lead, and the mallet and wedges were of tin. Then he began to cut. The edge of the axe turned back, and the mallet and wedges were beaten out of shape. He did not know how to manage. But at midday the maiden came once more with his dinner and comforted him. Lay thy head on my lap, said she, and sleep. When thou awakest, thy work will be done. She turned her wishing ring, and in an instant the whole forest fell down with a crash. The wood split and arranged itself in heaps, and it seemed just as if unseen giants were finishing the work. When he awoke, the maiden said, Dost thou see that the wood is piled up and arranged? One bough alone remains. But when the old woman comes this evening and asks thee about that bough, give her a blow with it and say, That is for thee, thou witch. The old woman came. There, thou seest how easy the work was, said she. But for whom hast thou left that bow which is lying there still? For thee, thou witch, he replied, and gave her a blow with it. But she pretended not to feel it, laughed scornfully, and said, Early tomorrow morning thou shalt arrange all the wood in one heap, set fire to it, and burn it. He rose at break of day and began to pick up the wood. But how can a single man get a whole forest together? The work made no progress. The maiden, however, did not desert him in his need. She brought him his food at noon, and when he had eaten, he laid his head on her lap and went to sleep. When he awoke, the entire pile of wood was burning in one enormous flame which stretched its tongues out into the sky. Listen to me, said the maiden. When the witch comes, she will give thee all kinds of orders. Do whatever she asks thee without fear, and then she will not be able to get the better of thee. But if thou art afraid, the fire will lay hold of thee and consume thee. At last, when thou hast done everything, seize her with both thy hands and throw her into the midst of the fire. The maiden departed, and the old woman came sneaking up to him. Oh, I am cold, said she but that is a fire that burns. It warms my old bones for me and does me good. But there is a log lying there which won't burn. Bring it out for me. When thou hast done that, thou art free and may go where thou likest. Come, go in with a good will. The drummer did not reflect long. He sprang into the midst of the flames, but they did not hurt him and could not even singe a hair of his head. He carried the log out and laid it down. Hardly, however, had the wood touched the earth than it was transformed, and the beautiful maiden who had helped him in his need stood before him, and by the silken and shining golden garments which she wore he knew right well that she was the king's daughter. But the old woman laughed venomously and said, Thou thinkest thou hast her safe, but thou hast not got her yet. Just as she was about to fall on the maiden and take her away, the youth seized the old woman with both his hands, raised her up on high, and threw her into the jaws of the fire, which closed over her as if it were delighted that the old witch was to be burnt. Then the king's daughter looked at the drummer, and when she saw that he was a handsome youth and remembered how he had risked his life to deliver her, she gave him her hand and said, Thou hast ventured everything for my sake but i also will do everything for thine promise to be true to me and thou shalt be my husband 
we shall not want for riches we shall have enough with what the witch has gathered together here she led him into the house where there were chests and coffers crammed with the old woman's treasures the maiden left the gold and silver where it was and took only the precious stones she would not stay any longer on the glass mountain so the drummer said to her seat thyself by me on my saddle and then we will fly down like birds i do not like the old saddle said she i need only turn my wishing ring and we shall be at home very well then answered the drummer then wish us in front of the town gate in the twinkling of an eye they were there but the drummer said i will just go to my parents and tell them the news wait for me outside here i shall soon be back ah said the king's daughter i beg thee to be careful on thy arrival do not kiss thy parents on the right cheek or else thou wilt forget everything and i shall stay behind here outside alone and deserted how can i forget thee said he and promised her to come back very soon and gave his hand upon it when he went into his father's house he had changed so much that no one knew who he was for the three days which he had passed on the glass mountain had been three years then he made himself known and his parents fell on his neck with joy and his heart was so moved that he forgot what the maiden had said and kissed them on both cheeks but when he had given them the kiss on the right cheek every thought of the king's daughter vanished from him he emptied out his pockets and laid handfuls of the largest jewels on the table the parents had not the least idea what to do with the riches then the father built a magnificent castle all surrounded by gardens woods and meadows as if a prince were going to live in it and when it was ready the mother said i have found a maiden for thee and the wedding shall be in three days the son was content to do as his parents desired the poor king's daughter had stood for a long time without the town waiting for the return of the young man when evening came she said he must certainly have kissed his parents on the right cheek and has forgotten me her heart was full of sorrow she wished herself into a solitary little hut in a forest and would not return to her father's court every evening she went into the town and passed the young man's house he often saw her but he no longer knew her at length she heard the people saying the wedding will take place tomorrow then she said i will try if i can win his heart back on the first day of the wedding ceremonies she turned her wishing ring and said a dress as bright as the sun instantly the dress lay before her and it was as bright as if it had been woven of real sunbeams when all the guests were assembled she entered the hall every one was amazed at the beautiful dress and the bride most of all and as pretty dresses were the things she had most delight in she went to the stranger and asked if she would sell it to her not for money she answered but if i may pass the first night outside the door of the room where your betrothed sleeps i will give it up to you the bride could not overcome her desire and consented but she mixed a sleeping draught with the wine her betrothed took at night which made him fall into a deep sleep when all had become quiet the king's daughter crouched down by the door of the bedroom opened it just a little and cried drummer drummer i pray thee hear hast thou forgotten thou heldest me dear that on the glass mountain we sat hour by hour that i rescued thy life from the witch's power didst thou not plight thy troth to me drummer drummer hearken to me but it was all in vain the drummer did not awake and when morning dawned the king's daughter was forced to go back again as she came on the second evening she turned her wishing ring and said a dress as silvery as the moon when she appeared at the feast in the dress which was as soft as moonbeams it again excited the desire of the bride and the king's daughter gave it to her for permission to pass the second night also outside the door of the bedroom then in the stillness of the night she cried drummer drummer i pray thee hear hast thou forgotten thou heldest me dear that on the glass mountain we sat hour by hour that i rescued thy life from the witch's power didst thou not plight thy troth to me drummer drummer hearken to me 
but the drummer who was stupefied with a sleeping draught could not be aroused sadly next morning she went back to her hut in the forest but the people in the house had heard the lamentation of the stranger maiden and told the bridegroom about it they told him also that it was impossible that he could hear anything of it because the maiden he was going to marry had poured a sleeping draught into his wine on the third evening the king's daughter turned her wishing ring and said a dress glittering like the stars when she showed herself therein at the feast the bride was quite beside herself with the splendor of the dress which far surpassed the others and she said i must and will have it the maiden gave it as she had given the others for permission to spend the night outside the bridegroom's door the bridegroom however did not drink the wine which was handed to him before he went to bed but poured it behind the bed and when everything was quiet he heard a sweet voice which called to him drummer drummer i pray thee hear hast thou forgotten thou heldest me dear that on the glass mountain we sat hour by hour that i rescued thy life from the witch's power didst thou not plight thy troth to me drummer drummer hearken to me suddenly his memory returned to him ah cried he how can i have acted so unfaithfully but the kiss which in the joy of my heart i gave my parents on the right cheek that is to blame for it all that is what stupefied me he sprang up took the king's daughter by the hand and led her to his parents bed this is my true bride said he if i marry the other i shall do a great wrong the parents when they heard how everything had happened gave their consent then the lights in the hall were lighted again drums and trumpets were brought friends and relations were invited to come and the real wedding was solemnized with great rejoicing the first bride received the beautiful dresses as a compensation and declared herself satisfied end of story 193
and the fruit trees were heavily laden with fruit. The grain of the year before still lay in such immense heaps on the floors that the rafters could hardly bear it. Then he went into the stable, where well-fed oxen, fat cows, and horses bright as looking-glass. At length he went back into his sitting-room and cast a glance at the iron chest in which his money lay. Whilst he was thus standing, surveying his riches, all at once there was a loud knock close by him. The knock was not at the door of his room, but at the door of his heart. It opened, and he heard a voice which said to him, Hast thou done good to thy family with it? Hast thou considered the necessities of the poor? Hast thou shared thy bread with the hungry? Hast thou been contented with what thou hast, or didst thou hast always desire to have more? The heart was not slow in answering. I have been hard and pitiless, and have never shown any kindness to my own family. If a beggar came, I turned away my eyes from him. I have not troubled myself about God, but have thought only of increasing my wealth. If everything which the sky covers had been mine own, I should still not have had enough. When he was aware of this answer, he was greatly alarmed. His knees began to tremble, and he was forced to sit down. Then there was another knock, but the knock was at the door of his room. It was his neighbor, a poor man, who had a number of children whom he could no longer satisfy with food. I know, thought the poor man, that my neighbor is rich, but he is as hard as he is rich. I don't believe he will help me but my children are crying for bread, so I will venture it, he said to the rich man. You do not readily give away anything that is yours, but I stand here like one who feels the water rising above his head. My children are starving. Lend me four measures of corn. The rich man looked at him long, and then the first sunbeam of mercy began to melt away a drop of the ice of greediness. I will not lend thee four measures, he answered but I will make thee a present of eight, but thou must fulfill one condition. What am I to do? said the poor man. When I am dead, thou shalt watch for three nights by my grave. The peasant was disturbed in his mind at this request, but in the need in which he was, he would have consented to anything. He accepted, therefore, and carried the corn home with him. It seemed as if the rich man had foreseen what was about to happen, for when three days were gone by, he suddenly dropped down dead. No one knew exactly how it came to pass, but no one grieved for him. When he was buried, the poor man remembered his promise. He would willingly have been released from it, but he thought, After all, he acted kindly by me. I have fed my hungry children with his corn. And even that were not the case, where I have once given my promise, I must keep it. At nightfall he went into the churchyard, and seated himself on the grave mound. Everything was quiet. Only the moon appeared above the grave, and frequently an owl flew past, and uttered her melancholy cry. When the sun rose, the poor man betook himself in safety to his home and in the same manner the second night passed quietly by. On the evening of the third day he felt a strange uneasiness. It seemed to him that something was about to happen. When he went out he saw, by the churchyard wall, a man whom he had never seen before. He was no longer young, had scars on his face, and his eyes looked sharply and eagerly around. He was entirely covered with an old cloak, and nothing was visible but his great riding boots. What are you looking for here? the peasant asked. Are you not afraid of the lonely churchyard? I am looking for nothing, he answered. I am afraid of nothing. I am like the youngster who went forth to learn how to shiver, and had his labor for his pains, but got the king's daughter to wife and great wealth with her, only I have remained poor. I am nothing but a paid-off soldier, and I mean to pass the night here, because I have no other shelter. If you are without fear, said the peasant, stay with me, and help me watch that grave there. To keep watch is a soldier's business, he replied. Whatever we fall in with here, 
whether it be good or bad, we will share it between us. The peasant agreed to this, and they seated themselves on the grave together. All was quiet until midnight, when suddenly a shrill whistling was heard in the air, and the two watchers perceived the evil one standing bodily before them. Be off, you ragamuffins, cried he to them. The man who lies in that grave belongs to me, and I want to take him, and if you don't go away, I will wring your necks. Sir, with the red feather, said the soldier, you are not my captain. I have no need to obey you, and I have not yet learned how to fear. Go away. We shall stay sitting here. The devil thought to himself, Money is the best thing with which to get hold of these two vagabonds. So he began to play a softer tune, and asked quite kindly if they would not accept a bag of money and go home with it. That is worth listening to, answered the soldier. But one bag of gold won't serve us. If you will give us as much as will go into one of my boots, we will quit the field for you and go away. I have not so much as that about me, said the devil, but I will fetch it. In the neighboring town lives a money changer who is a good friend of mine and will readily advance it to me. When the devil had vanished, the soldier took his left boot off and said, We will soon pull the charcoal burner's nose from him. Just give me your knife, comrade. He cut the sole off the boot and put it in the high grass near the grave on the edge of a hole that was half overgrown. That will do, said he. Now the chimney sweep may come. They both sat down and waited, and it was not long before the devil returned with a small bag of gold in his hand. Just pour it in, said the soldier, raising up the boot a little. But that won't be enough. The black one shook out all that was in the bag. The gold fell through, and the boot remained empty. Stupid devil, cried the soldier. It won't do. Didn't I say so at once? Go back again, and bring more. The devil shook his head and went, and in an hour's time came with a much larger bag under his arm. Now pour it in, cried the soldier, but I doubt the boot won't be full. The gold clinked as it fell, but the boot remained empty. The devil looked in himself with his burning eyes and convinced himself of the truth. You have shamefully big calves to your legs, cried he, and made a wry face. Did you think, replied the soldier, that I had a cloven foot like you? Since when have you been so stingy? See that you get more gold together, or our bargain will come to nothing. The wicked one went off again. This time he stayed away longer, and when at length he appeared, he was panting under the weight of a sack which lay on his shoulders. He emptied it into the boot, which was just as far from being filled as before. He became furious, and was just going to tear the boot out of the soldier's hands, but at that moment the first ray of the rising sun broke forth from the sky, and the evil spirit fled away with loud shrieks. The poor soul was saved. The peasant wished to divide the gold, but the soldier said, Give what falls to my lot to the poor. I will come with thee to thy cottage, and together we will live in rest and peace on what remains, as long as God is pleased to permit. End of story 195。Story 196 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Translated by Margaret Hunt Old Rink Rank There was once, on a time, a king who had a daughter, and he caused a glass mountain to be made, and said that whosoever could cross to the other side of it without falling should have his daughter to wife. Then there was one who loved the king's daughter, and he asked the king if he might have her. Yes, said the king, if you can cross the mountain without falling, you shall have her. And the princess said she would go over it with him, and would hold him if he were about to fall. So they set out together to go over it, and when they were half way up the princess slipped and fell, and the glass mountain opened and shut her up inside it, 
and her betrothed could not see where she had gone, for the mountain closed immediately. Then he wept and lamented much, and the king was miserable too, and had the mountain broken open where she had been lost, and though he would be able to get her out again, but they could not find the place into which she had fallen. Meanwhile the king's daughter had fallen quite deep down into the earth, into a great cave. An old fellow with a very long grey beard came to meet her, and told her that if she would be his servant, and do everything he bade her, she might live. If not, he would kill her. So she did all he bade her. In the mornings he took his ladder out of his pocket, and set it up against the mountain, and climbed to the top by its help, and then he drew up the ladder after him. The princess had to cook his dinner, make his bed, and do all his work, and when he came home again he always brought with him a heap of gold and silver. When she had lived with him for many years, and had grown quite old, he called her Mother Mansrot, and she had to call him Old Rinkrank. Then once when he was out, and she had made his bed, and washed his dishes, she shut the doors and windows all fast, and there was one little window through which the light shone in, and this she left open. When old Rinkrank came home, he knocked at his door and cried, "'Mother Mansrot, open the door for me.' "'No,' said she. "'Old Rinkrank, I will not open the door for thee.' Then he said, "'Here stand I, poor Rinkrank, on my seventeen long shanks, on my weary, worn-out foot. Wash my dishes, Mother Mansrot.' "'I have washed thy dishes already,' said she. Then again he said, "'Here stand I, poor Rinkrank, on my seventeen long shanks, on my weary, worn-out foot. Make my bed, Mother Mansrot.' "'I have made thy bed already,' said she. Then again he said, "'Here stand I, poor Rinkrank, on my seventeen long shanks, on my weary, worn-out foot. Open the door, Mother Mansrot.' Then he ran all round his house and saw that the little window was open, and thought, "'I will look in and see what she can be about, and why she will not open the door for me.' He tried to peep in, but could not get his head through because of his long beard. So he first put his beard through the open window. But just as he had got it through, Mother Manstrup came by and pulled the window down with a cord which she had tied to it, and his beard was shut fast in. Then he began to cry most piteously, for it hurt him very much and to entreat her to release him again. But she said not until he gave her the ladder with which he ascended the mountain. Then, whether he would or not, he had to tell her where the ladder was. And she fastened a very long ribbon to the window, and then she set up the ladder, and ascended the mountain, and when she was at the top of it she opened the window. She went to her father, and told him all that had happened to her. The king rejoiced greatly, and her betrothed was still there and they went and dug up the mountain, and found old Rinkrank inside it with all his gold and silver. Then the king had old Rinkrank put to death, and took all his gold and silver. The princess married her betrothed, and lived right happily in great magnificence and joy. End of story 196「Story 197 of Household Tales」this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org household tales by jacob and wilhelm grimm translated by margaret hunt the crystal ball there was once an enchantress who had three sons who loved each other as brothers but the old woman did not trust them and thought they wanted to steal her power from her so she changed the eldest into an eagle, which was forced to dwell in the rocky mountains, and was often seen sweeping in great circles in the sky. The second she changed into a whale, which lived in the deep sea, and all that was seen of it was that it sometimes spouted up a great jet of water in the air. Each of them only bore his human form for only two hours daily. The third son, who was afraid she might change him into a raging wild beast, a bear perhaps, or a wolf, went secretly away. He had heard that a king's daughter, who was bewitched, 
was imprisoned in the castle of the golden sun and was waiting for deliverance those however who tried to free her risked their lives three and twenty youths had already died a miserable death and now only one other might make the attempt after which no more must come and as his heart was without fear he caught at the idea of seeking out the castle of the golden sun he had already travelled about for a long time without being able to find it when he came by chance into a great forest and did not know the way out of it all at once he saw in the distance two giants who made a sign to him with their hands and when he came to them they said we are quarrelling about a cap and which of us it belongs to and as we are equally strong neither of us can get the better of the other the small men are cleverer than we are so we will leave the decision to thee how can you dispute about an old cap said the youth thou dost not know what properties it has it is a wishing cap whosoever puts it on can wish himself away wherever he likes and in an instant he will be there give me the cap said the youth i will go a short distance off and when i call you you must run a race and the cap shall belong to the one who gets first to me he put it on and went away and thought of the king's daughter forgot the giants and walked continually onward at length he sighed from the very bottom of his heart and cried ah if i were but at the castle of the golden sun and hardly had the words passed his lips than he was standing on a high mountain before the gate of the castle he entered and went through all the rooms until in the last he found the king's daughter but how shocked he was when he saw her she had an ashen gray face full of wrinkles blear eyes and red hair are you the king's daughter whose beauty the whole world praises cried he ah she answered this is not my form human eyes can only see me in this state of ugliness but that thou mayst know what i am like look in the mirror it does not let itself be misled it will show thee my image as it is in truth she gave him the mirror in his hand and he saw therein the likeness of the most beautiful maiden on earth and saw too how the tears were rolling down her cheeks with grief then said he how canst thou be set free i fear no danger she said he who gets the crystal ball and holds it before the enchanter will destroy his power with it and i shall resume my true shape ah she added so many have already gone to meet death for this and thou art so young i grieve that thou shouldst encounter such great danger nothing can keep me from doing it said he but tell me what i must do thou shalt know everything said the king's daughter when thou descendest the mountain on which the castle stands a wild bull will stand below by a spring and thou must fight with it and if thou hast the luck to kill it a fiery bird will spring out of it which bears in its body a burning egg and in the egg the crystal ball lies like a yoke the bird will not however let the egg fall until forced to do so and if it falls on the ground it will flame up and burn everything that is near and melt even ice itself and with it the crystal ball and then all thy trouble will have been in vain the youth went down to the spring where the bull snorted and bellowed at him after a long struggle he plunged his sword in the animal's body and it fell down instantly a fiery bird arose from it and was about to fly away but the young man's brother the eagle who was passing between the clouds swooped down hunted it away to the sea and struck it with his beak until in its extremity it let the egg fall the egg did not however fall into the sea but on a fisherman's hut which stood on the shore and the hut began at once to smoke and it was about to break out in flames then arose in the sea waves as high as a house they streamed over the hut and subdued the fire the other brother the whale had come swimming to them and had driven the water up on high when the fire was extinguished 
the youth sought for the egg and happily found it it was not yet melted but the shell was broken by being so suddenly cooled with water and he could take out the crystal ball unhurt when the youth went to the enchanter and held it before him the latter said my power is destroyed and from this time forth thou art the king of the castle of the golden sun with this canst thou likewise give back to thy brothers their human form then the youth hastened to the king's daughter and when he entered the room she was standing there in the full splendor of her beauty and joyfully they exchanged rings with each other end of story 197story 198 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn stanley household tales by jacob and wilhelm grin translated by margaret hunt maid marlene there once was a king who had a son who asked in marriage the daughter of a mighty king she was called maid marlene and was very beautiful as her father wished to give her to another the prince was rejected but as they both loved each other with all their hearts they would not give each other up and maid marlene said to her father i can and will take no other for my husband then the king flew into a passion and ordered a dark tower to be built into which no ray of sunlight or moonlight should enter when it was finished he said therein shalt thou be imprisoned for seven years and then i will come and see if thy perverse spirit is broken meat and drink for the seven years were carried into the tower and then she and her waiting woman were led into it and walled up and thus cut off from the sky and from the earth there they sat in the darkness and knew not when day or night began the king's son often went round and round the tower and called their names but no sound from without pierced through the thick walls what else could they do but lament and complain meanwhile the time passed and by the diminution of the food and drink they knew that the seven years were coming to an end they thought the moment of their deliverance was come but no stroke of the hammer was heard no stone fell out of the wall and it seemed to maid marlene that her father had forgotten her as they only had food for a short time longer and saw a miserable death awaiting them maid marlene said we must try our last chance and see if we can break through the wall she took the bread knife and picked and bored at the mortar of a stone and when she was tired the waiting maid took her turn with great labor they succeeded in getting out one stone and then a second and a third and when three days were over the first ray of light fell on their darkness and at last the opening was so large that they could look out the sky was blue and a fresh breeze played on their faces but how melancholy everything looked all around her father's castle lay in ruins the town and the villages were so far as could be seen destroyed by fire the fields far and wide laid to waste and no human being was visible when the opening in the wall was large enough for them to slip through the waiting maid sprang down first and then maid Malian followed but where were they to go the enemy had ravaged the whole kingdom driven away the king and slain all the inhabitants they wandered forth to seek another country but nowhere did they find a shelter or a human being to give them a mouthful of bread and their need was so great that they were forced to appease their hunger with nettles when after long journeying they came into another country they tried to get work everywhere but wherever they knocked they were turned away and no one would have pity on them at last they arrived in a large city and went to the royal palace there also they were ordered to go away but at last the cook said that they might stay in the kitchen and be scullions the son of the king in whose kingdom they were was however the very man who had been betrothed to maid marlene his father had chosen another bride for him whose face was as ugly as her heart was wicked the wedding was fixed and the maiden had already arrived but because of her great ugliness however she shut herself in her room 
and allowed no one to see her, and Maid Marlene had to take her her meals from the kitchen. When the day came for the bride and the bridegroom to go to church, she was ashamed of her ugliness, and afraid that if she showed herself in the streets, she would be mocked and laughed at by the people. Then said she to Maid Marlene, A great piece of luck has befallen thee. I have sprained my foot, and cannot well walk through the streets. Thou shalt put on my wedding clothes, and take my place. A greater honour than that thou canst not have. Maid Marlene, however, refused it, and said, I wish for no honour which is not suitable for me. It was in vain, too, that the bride offered her gold. At last she said angrily, If thou dost not obey me, it shall cost thee thy life. I have but to speak the word, and thy head will lie at thy feet. Then she was forced to obey, and put on the bride's magnificent clothes and all her jewels. When she entered the royal hall, every one was amazed at her great beauty, and the king said to his son, This is the bride whom I have chosen for thee, and whom thou must lead to church. The bridegroom was astonished, and thought, She is like my maid Marlene, and I should believe that it was she herself, but she has long been shut up in the tower, or dead. He took her by the hand and led her to church. On the way was a nettle plant, and she said, O oh, nettle plant, little nettle plant, what dost thou here alone? I have known the time when I ate thee unboiled, when I ate thee unroasted. What art thou saying? asked the king's son. Nothing, she replied. I was only thinking of Maid Marlene. He was surprised that she knew about her, but kept silence. When they came to the footplank into the church, she said, Footbridge, do not break. I am not the true bride. What art thou saying there? asked the king's son. Nothing, she replied. I was only thinking of Maid Marlene. Dost thou know Maid Marlene? No, she answered. How should I know her? I have only heard of her. When they came to the church door, she said once more, Church door, break not. I am not the true bride. What art thou saying there? asked he. Ah, she answered, I was only thinking of Maid Marlene. Then he took out a precious chain, put it round her neck, and fastened the clasp. Thereupon they entered the church, and the priest joined their hands together before the altar, and married them. He led her home, but she did not speak a single word the whole way. When they got back to the royal palace, she hurried into the bride's chamber, put off the magnificent clothes and the jewels, dressed herself in her grey gown, and kept nothing but the jewel on her neck, which she had received from the bridegroom. When the night came, and the bride was to be led into the prince's apartment, she let the veil fall over her face, that he might not observe the deception. As soon as every one had gone away, he said to her, What didst thou say to the nettle plant which was growing by the wayside? To which nettle plant? asked she. I don't talk to nettle plants. If thou didst not do it, then thou art not the true bride, said he. So she bethought to herself and said, I must go out unto my maid, who keeps my thoughts for me. She went out and sought Maid Marlene. Girl, what hast thou been saying to the nettle? I said nothing but, O oh, nettle plant, little nettle plant, what dost thou here alone? I have known the time when I ate thee unboiled, when I ate thee unroasted. The bride ran back into the chamber and said, I know now what I said to the nettle, and she repeated the words which she had just heard. "'But what didst thou say to the footbridge when we went over it?' asked the king's son. "'To the footbridge?' she answered. "'I don't talk to footbridges.' "'Then thou art not the true bride.' She said again, "'I must go out unto my maid, who keeps my thoughts for me,' and ran out and found Maid Marlene. "'Girl, what didst thou say to the footbridge?' "'I said nothing but, "'Footbridge, do not break. I am not the true bride.' "'That costs thee thy life!' cried the bride. But she hurried into the room and said, "'I know now what I said to the footbridge.' And she repeated the words, "'But what didst thou say to the church door?' "'To the church door,' she replied. "'I don't talk to church doors.' "'Then thou art not the true bride.' She went out and found Maid Marlene, and said, "'Girl, what didst thou say to the church door?' 
I said nothing but church door, break not, I am not the true bride. That will break thy neck for thee, cried the bride, and flew into a terrible passion. But she hastened back into the room and said, I know now what I said to the church door, and she repeated the words. But where hast thou the jewel which I gave thee at the church door? What jewel? she answered. Thou didst not give me any jewel. I myself put it around thy neck, and I myself fastened it. If thou dost not know that, thou art not the true bride. He drew the veil from her face, and when he saw her immeasurable ugliness, he sprang back terrified, and said, How comest thou here? Who art thou? I am thy betrothed bride. But because I feared lest the people should mock me when they saw me out of doors, I commanded the scullery maid to dress herself in my clothes, and to go to the church instead of me. Where is the girl? said he. I want to see her. Go and bring her here. She went out and told the servants that the scullery maid was an impostor, and that they must take her out into the courtyard and strike off her head. The servants laid hold of Maid Marlene, and wanted to drag her out. But she screamed so loudly for help that the king's son heard her voice, hurried out of his chamber, and ordered them to set the maiden free instantly. Lights were brought, and then he saw on her neck the gold chain which he had given her at the church door. "'Thou art the true bride,' said he, who went with me to the church. "'Come with me now to my room.' When they were both alone, he said, "'On the way to the church thou didst name Maid Marlene,' who was my betrothed bride. If I could believe it possible, I should think she was standing before me. Thou art like her in every respect. She answered, I am Maid Marlene, who for thy sake was in prison seven years in the darkness, who suffered hunger and thirst, and has lived so long in want and poverty. Today, however, the sun is shining on me once more. I was married to thee in the church, and I am thy lawful wife. Then they kissed each other, and were happy all the days of their lives. The false bride was rewarded for what she had done by having her head cut off. The tower in which Maid Marlene had been imprisoned remained standing for a long time, and when the children passed by it, they sang, King Clang Gloria, who sits within this tower, a king's daughter, she sits within. A sight of her I cannot win, the wall it will not break, the stone cannot be pierced, little Hans, with your coat so gay, follow me, follow me, fast as you may. End of 198。Story 199 of Household Tales。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. The Boots of Buffalo Leather. A soldier who is afraid of nothing troubles himself about nothing. One of this kind had received his discharge, and as he has learnt no trade and could earn nothing, he travelled about and begged alms of kind people. He had an old waterproof on his back, and a pair of riding boots of buffalo leather which were still left to him. One day he was walking he knew not where, straight out into the open country, and at length came to a forest. He did not know where he was, but saw sitting on the trunk of a tree, which had been cut down, a man who was well dressed and wore a green shooting coat. The soldier shook hands with him, sat down on the grass by his side, and stretched out his legs. I see thou hast good boots on, which are well blacked, he said to the huntsman, but if thou hadst to travel about as I have, they would not last long. Look at mine, they are of buffalo leather, and have been worn for a long time, but in them I can go through thick and thin. After a while the soldier got up and said, I can stay no longer. Hunger drives me onwards. But, brother Bright Boots, where does this road lead to? I don't know that myself, answered the huntsman. I have lost my way in the forest. Then thou art in the same plight as I, said the soldier. 
Birds of a feather flock together. Let us remain together and seek our way. The huntsmen smiled a little, and they walked on further and further until night fell. We do not get out of the forest, said the soldier, but there in the distance I see a light shining which will help us to something to eat. They found a stone house, knocked at the door, and an old woman opened it. We are looking for quarters for the night, said the soldier, and some lining for our stomachs, for mine is as empty as an old knapsack. You cannot stay here, answered the old woman. This is a robber's house, and you would do wisely to get away before they come home, or you will be lost. It won't be so bad as that, answered the soldier. I have not had a mouthful for two days, and whether I am murdered here or die of hunger in the forest is all the same to me. I shall go in. The huntsman would not follow, but the soldier drew him in with him by the sleeve. Come, my dear brother, we shall not come to an end so quickly as that. The old woman had pity on them and said, Creep in here behind the stove, and if they leave anything, I will give it to you on the sly when they are asleep. Scarcely were they in the corner before twelve robbers came bursting in, seated themselves at the table which was already laid, and vehemently demanded some food. The old woman brought in some great dishes of roast meat, and the robbers enjoyed that thoroughly. When the smell of the food ascended the nostrils of the soldier, he said to the huntsman, I cannot hold out any longer. I shall seat myself at the table and eat with them. Thou wilt bring us to destruction, said the huntsman, and held him back by the arm. But the soldier began to cough loudly. When the robbers heard that, they threw away their knives and forks, leapt up, and discovered the two who were behind the stove. Aha, gentlemen, are you in the corner? cried they. What are you doing here? Have you been sent as spies? Wait a while, and you shall learn how to fly on a dry bough. But do be civil, said the soldier. I am hungry. Give me something to eat, and then you can do what you like with me. The robbers were astonished, and the captain said, I see that thou hast no fear. Well, thou shalt have some food but after that thou must die we shall see said the soldier and seated himself at the table and began to cut away valiantly at the roast meat brother brightboots come and eat he cried to the huntsman thou must be as hungry as i am and cannot have better roast meat at home but the huntsman would not eat the robbers looked at the soldier in astonishment and said the rascal uses no ceremony after a while, he said, I have had enough food. Now get me something good to drink. The captain was in the mood to humor him in this also, and called to the old woman. Bring a bottle out of the cellar, and mind it to be of the best. The soldier drew the cork out with a loud noise, and then went with the bottle to the huntsman, and said, Pay attention, brother, and thou shalt see something that will surprise thee. I am now going to drink the health of the whole clan. Then he brandished the bottle over the heads of the robbers and cried, Long life to you all, but with your mouths opened and your right hands lifted up. And then he drank a hearty draught. Scarcely were the words said than they all sat motionless as if made of stone, and their mouths were open, and their right hands stretched up in the air. The huntsman said to the soldier, I see that thou art acquainted with tricks of another kind, but now come and let us go home. Oh, ho, my dear brother, but that would be marching away far too soon. We have conquered the enemy, and must first take the booty. Those men there are sitting fast, and are opening their mouths with astonishment, but they will not be allowed to move until I permit them. Come, eat and drink. The old woman had to bring another bottle of the best wine, and the soldier would not stir until he had eaten enough to last for three days. At last, when day came, he said, now it is time to strike our tents, and that our march may be a short one. The old woman shall show us the nearest way to the town. When they had arrived there, he went to his old comrades and said, Out in the forest I have found a nest full of gallows birds. Come with me, and we will take it. The soldier led them, and said to the huntsman, Thou must go back again with me to see how they shake when we seize them by the feet. He placed the men round about the robbers, and then he took the bottle, drank a mouthful, brandished it above them, and cried, Live again! Instantly they all regained the power of movement, 
but were thrown down and bound hand and foot with cords. Then the soldier ordered them to be thrown into a cart as if they had been so many sacks, and said, Now drive them straight to prison. The huntsman, however, took one of the men aside and gave him another commission besides. Brother Brightboots, said the soldier, we have safely routed the enemy and been well fed. Now we will quietly walk behind them as if we were stragglers. When they approached the town, the soldier saw a crowd of people pouring through the gates of the town who were raising loud cries of joy and waving green boughs in the air. Then he saw that the entire bodyguard was coming up. What can this mean? said he to the huntsman. Dost thou not know, he replied, that the king has for a long time been absent from his kingdom, and that today he is returning, and every one is going to meet him? But where is the king? said the soldier. I do not see him. Here he is, answered the huntsman. I am the king, and have announced my arrival. Then he opened his hunting coat, and his royal garments were visible. The soldier was alarmed and fell on his knees and begged him to forgive him for having in his ignorance treated him as an equal and spoken to him by such a name. But the king shook hands with him and said, Thou art a brave soldier and hast saved my life. Thou shalt never again be in want. I will take care of thee, and if ever thou wouldst like to eat a piece of roast meat as good as that in the robber's house, come to the royal kitchen. But if thou wouldst drink a health, thou must first ask my permission. End of story 199by Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm, translated by Margaret Hunt. The Golden Key In the winter time, when deep snow lay on the ground, a poor boy was forced to go out on a sledge to fetch wood. When he had gathered it together and packed it, he wished, as he was so frozen with cold, not to go home at once, but to light a fire and warm himself a little. So he scraped away the snow, and as he was thus clearing the ground, he found a tiny gold key. Hereupon he thought that where the key was, the lock must be also, and dug in the ground and found an iron chest. If the key does but fit it, thought he, no doubt there are precious things in that little box. He searched, but no keyhole was there. At last he discovered one, but so small that it was hardly visible. He tried it, and the key fit it exactly. Then he turned it once around, and now we must wait until he has quite unlocked it and opened the lid, and then we shall learn what wonderful things were lying in that box. End of story 200 Section 201 of Household Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. Household Tales by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Legend 1. St. Joseph in the Forest. There was once upon a time a mother who had three daughters, the eldest of whom was rude and wicked, the second much better, although she had her faults, but the youngest was a pious, good child. The mother was, however, so strange that it was just the eldest daughter whom she most loved, and she could not bear the youngest. On this account, she often sent the poor girl out into the great forest in order to get rid of her, for she thought she would lose herself and never come back again. But the guardian angel, which every good child has, did not forsake her but always brought her into the right path again. Once, however, the guardian angel behaved as if he were not there, and the child could not find her way out of the forest again. She walked on constantly until evening came, and then she saw a tiny light burning in the distance, ran up to it at once, and came to a little hut. She knocked, the door opened, 
and she came to a second door, where she knocked again. An old man, who had a snow-white beard and looked venerable, opened it for her, and he was no other than St. Joseph. He said quite kindly, Come, dear child, seat thyself on my little chair by the fire and warm thyself. I will fetch thee clear water, if thou art thirsty. But here in the forest I have nothing for thee to eat but a couple of little roots, which thou must first scrape and boil. St. Joseph gave her the roots. The girl scraped them clean. Then she brought a piece of pancake and the bread that her mother had given her to take with her, mixed all together in a pan, and cooked herself a thick soup. When it was ready, St. Joseph said, I am so hungry. Give me some of thy food. The child was quite willing, and gave him more than she kept for herself. But God's blessing was with her, so that she was satisfied. When they had eaten, St. Joseph said, Now we will go to bed. I have, however, only one bed. Lay thyself in it. I will lie on the ground on the straw. No, answered she. Stay in your own bed. The straw is soft enough for me. St. Joseph, however, took the child in his arms, and carried her into the little bed, and there she said her prayers, and fell asleep. Next morning, when she awoke, she wanted to say good morning to St. Joseph, but she did not see him. Then she got up and looked for him, but could not find him anywhere. At last she perceived, behind the door, a bag with money so heavy that she could just carry it, and on it was written that it was for the child who had slept there that night. On this she took the bag, bounded away with it, and got safely to her mother. And as she gave her mother all the money, she could not help being satisfied with her. The next day the second child also took a fancy to go into the forest. Her mother gave her a much larger piece of pancake and bread. It happened with her just as with the first child. In the evening she came to St. Joseph's little hut, who gave her roots for a thick soup. When it was ready, he likewise said to her, I am so hungry, give me some of thy food. Then the child said, You may have your share. Afterwards, when St. Joseph offered her his bed and wanted to lie on the straw, she replied, No, lie down in the bed, there is plenty of room for both of us. St. Joseph took her in his arms and put her in the bed and laid himself on the straw. In the morning, when the child awoke and looked for St. Joseph, he had vanished, but behind the door she found a little sack of money that was about as long as a hand, and on it was written that it was for the child who had slept there last night. So she took the little bag and ran home with it, and took it to her mother, but she secretly kept two pieces for herself. The eldest child had by this time grown curious, and the next morning also insisted on going out into the forest. Her mother gave her pancakes with her, as many as she wanted, and bread and cheese as well. In the evening she found St. Joseph in his little hut, just as the two others had found him. When the soup was ready, and St. Joseph said, I am so hungry, give me some of thy food, the girl answered, Wait until I am satisfied. Then, if there's anything left, thou shalt have it. She ate, however, nearly the whole of it, and St. Joseph had to scrape the dish. Afterwards, the good old man offered her his bed, and wanted to lie on the straw. She took it without making any opposition, laid herself down in the little bed, and left the hard straw to the white-haired man. Next morning, when she awoke, St. Joseph was not to be found. But she did not trouble herself about that. She looked behind the door for a money bag. She fancied something was lying on the ground, but as she could not very well distinguish what it was, she stooped down and examined it closely. But it remained hanging to her nose. And when she got up again, she saw, to her horror, that it was a second nose which was hanging fast to her own. Then she began to scream and howl, but that did no good. She was forced to see it always on her nose, for it stretched out so far. 
Then she ran out and screamed without stopping till she met St. Joseph, at whose feet she fell and begged, until, out of pity, he took the nose off her again, and even gave her two farthings. When she got home, her mother was standing before the door, and asked, What hast thou had given to thee? Then she lied, and said, A great bag of money, but I have lost it on the way. Lost it? cried the mother. Oh, but we will soon find it again. And took her by the hand, and wanted to seek it with her. At first she began to cry, and did not wish to go. But at last she went. On the way, however, so many lizards and snakes broke loose on both of them, that they did not know how to save themselves. At last they stung the wicked child to death, and they stung the mother in the foot, because she had not brought her up better. End of 201 Story number 202 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thea from Hebersham. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Legend 2. The Twelve Apostles. Three hundred years before the birth of the Lord Christ, there lived a mother who had twelve sons, but was so poor and needy that she no longer knew how she was to keep them alive at all. She prayed to God daily that he would grant that all her sons might be on the earth with the Redeemer who was promised. When her necessity became still greater, she sent one of them after the other out into the world to seek bread for her. The eldest was called Peter, and he went out and had already walked a long way, a whole day's journey, when he came into a great forest. He sought for a way out, but could find none, and went farther and farther astray, and at the same time felt such great hunger that he could scarcely stand. At length he became so weak that he was forced to lie down, and believed death to be at hand. Suddenly, there stood beside him a small boy, who shone with brightness, and was as beautiful and kind as an angel. The child smote his little hands together until Peter was forced to look up and saw him. Then the child said, Why art thou sitting there in such trouble? Alas, answered Peter, I am going about the world seeking bread, that I may yet see the dear Saviour who is promised. That is my greatest desire. The child said, Come with me, and thy wish shall be fulfilled. He took poor Peter by the hand, and led him between some cliffs to a great cavern. When they entered it, everything was shining with gold, silver, and crystal, and in the midst of it twelve cradles were standing side by side. Then said the little angel, Lie down in the first, and sleep a while. I will rock thee. Peter did so and the angel sang to him and rocked him until he was asleep. And when he was asleep, the second brother came also, guided thither by his guardian angel, and he was rocked to sleep like the first. And thus came the others, one after the other, until all twelve lay there sleeping in the golden cradles. They slept, however, three hundred years, until the night when the Saviour of the world was born, when they awoke and were with him on earth and were called the Twelve Apostles. End of story number 202. Story number 203 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Theo from Hebersham. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunts. Legend 3. The Rose There was once a poor woman who had two children. 
the youngest had to go every day into the forest to fetch wood. Once, when she had gone a long way to seek it, a little child, who was quite strong, came and helped her industriously to pick up the wood and carry it home. And then before a moment had passed, the strange child disappeared. The child told her mother this, but at first she would not believe it. At length, she brought a rose home and told her mother that the beautiful child had given her this rose and had told her that when it was in full bloom, he would return. The mother put the rose in water. One morning, her child could not get out of bed. The mother went to the bed and found her dead, but she lay looking very happy. On the same morning, the rose was in full bloom. End of story number 203. Story number 204 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Theo from Hebersham. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Legend 4. Poverty and humility lead to heaven. There was once a king's son who went out into the world and he was full of thought and sad. He looked at the sky, which was so beautifully pure and blue. Then he sighed and said, How well must all be with one up there in heaven. Then he saw a poor grey-haired man who was coming along the road towards him. And he spoke to him and asked him, how can I get to heaven? The man answered, By poverty and humility. Put on my ragged clothes, wander about the world for seven years, and get to know what misery is. Take no money, but if thou art hungry, ask compassionate hearts for a bit of bread. In this way thou wilt reach heaven. Then the king's son took off his magnificent coat and wore in its place the beggar's garment went out into the wide world and suffered great misery. He took nothing but a little food, said nothing, but prayed to the Lord to take him into his heaven. When the seven years were over, he returned to his father's palace, but no one recognized him. He said to the servants, Go and tell my parents that I have come back again. But the servants did not believe it, and laughed and left him standing there. Then said he, Go and tell it to my brothers, that they may come down, for I should so like to see them again. The servants would not do that either, but at last one of them went and told it to the king's children. But the these did not believe it and did not trouble themselves about it. Then he wrote a letter to his mother and described to her all his misery, but he did not say that he was her son. So, out of pity, the queen had a place under the stairs assigned to him, and food taken to him daily by two servants. But one of them was ill-natured and said, Why should the beggar have the good food, and kept it for himself, or gave it to the dogs, and took the weak, wasted-away beggar nothing but water? The other, however, was honest, and took the beggar what was sent to him. It was little but he could live on it for a while, and all the time he was quite patient, but he grew continually weaker. As, however, his illness increased, he desired to receive the last sacrament. When the host was being elevated down below, all the bells in the town and neighbourhood began to ring. After Mass, the priest went to the poor man, under the stairs, and there he lay dead. In one hand he had a rose, in the other a lily, and beside him was a paper in which was written his history. When he was buried, a rose grew on one side of his grave and a lily on the other. End of story number 204 Story number 
205 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Theo from Hebersham. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Legend 5. God's Food. There were once upon a time two sisters, one of whom had no children and was rich, and the other had five and was a widow, and so poor that she no longer had food enough to satisfy herself and her children. In her need, therefore, she went to her sister and said, My children and I are suffering the greatest hunger. Thou art rich, give me a mouthful of bread. The very rich sister was as hard as stone, and said, I myself have nothing in the house, and drove away the poor creature with harsh words. After some time the husband of the rich sister came home, and was just going to cut himself a piece of bread. But when he made the first cut into the loaf, out flowed red blood. When the woman saw that she was terrified and told him what had occurred, he hurried away to help the widow and her children. But when he entered her room, he found her praying. She had her two youngest children in her arms, and the three eldest were lying dead. He offered her food, but she answered, For earthly food have we no longer any desire. God has already satisfied the hunger of three of us, and he will hearken to our supplications likewise. Scarcely had she uttered these words, than the two little ones drew their last breath, whereupon her heart broke, and she sank down dead. End of story number 205Story number 206 of Household Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Theo from Hebersham. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Legend 6. The Three Green Twigs. There was once on a time a hermit who lived in a forest at the foot of a mountain, and passed his time in prayer and good works, and every evening he carried, to the glory of God, two pails of water up the mountain. Many a beast drank of it, and many a plant was refreshed by it, for on the heights above a strong wind blew continually, which dried the air and the ground, and the wild birds which dread mankind wheel about there and with their sharp eyes search for a drink. And because the hermit was so pious, an angel of God, visible to his eyes, went up with him, counted his steps, and when the work was completed, brought him his food, even as a prophet of old was by God's command, fed by the raven. When the hermit in his piety had already reached a great age, it happened that he once saw from afar a poor sinner being taken to the gallows. He said carelessly to himself, There, that one is getting his desserts. In the evening, when he was carrying the water up the mountain, the angel, who usually accompanied him, did not appear, and also brought him no food. Then he was terrified, and searched his heart, and tried to think how he could have sinned. As God was so angry, but he did not discover it. Then he neither ate nor drank, threw himself down on the ground and prayed day and night. And as he was one day thus bitterly weeping in the forest, he heard a little bird singing beautifully and delightfully. And then he was still more troubled and said, How joyously thou singest! The Lord is not angry with thee. Ah, if thou couldst but tell me how I can have offended him, that I might do penance, and then my heart also would be glad again. Then the bird began 
to speak, and said, Thou hast done injustice, in that thou hast condemned a poor sinner who was being wed to the gallows, and for that the Lord is angry with thee. He alone sits in judgment. However, if thou wilt do penance and repent thy sins, he will forgive thee. And the angel stood beside him with a dry branch in his hand and said, Thou shalt carry this dry branch until three green twigs sprout out of it. But at night, when thou wilt sleep, thou shalt lay it under thy head. Thou shalt beg thy bread from door to door, and not carry more than one night in the same house. That is the penance which the Lord lays on thee. The hermit took the piece of wood and went back into the world which he had not seen for so long. He ate and drank nothing, but what was given him at the doors, many petitions were, however, not listened to, and many doors remained shut to him, so that he often did not get a crumb of bread. Once, when he had gone from door to door from morning till night, and no one had given him anything, and no one would shelter him for the night, he went forth into a forest, and at last found a cave which someone had made, and an old woman was sitting in it. Then said he, Good woman, keep me with you in your house for this night. But she said, No, I dare not, even if I wished. I have three sons who are wicked and wild, and if they come home from their robbing expedition and find you, they would kill us both. The hermit said, Let me stay. They will do no injury either to you or to me. And the woman was compassionate and let herself be persuaded. Then the man lay down beneath the stairs and put the bit of wood under his head. When the old woman saw him do that, she asked the reason of it, on which he told her that he carried the bit of wood about with him for a penance and used it at night for a pillow, and that he had offended the Lord, because, when he had seen a poor sinner on the way to the gallows, he had said he was getting his deserts. Then the woman began to weep, and cried, If the Lord thus punishes one single word, how will it fare with my sons when they appear before him in judgment? At midnight the robbers came home and blustered and stormed. They made a fire, and when it had lighted up the cave, and they saw a man lying under the stairs, they fell in a rage and cried to their mother, Who is the man? Have we not forbidden any one whatsoever to be taken in? Then said the mother, Let him alone. It is a poor sinner who is expiating his crime. The robbers asked, What has he done? Old man, cried they, tell us thy sins. The old man raised himself and told them how he, by one single word, had so sinned that God was angry with him, and how he was now expiating this crime. The robbers were so powerfully touched in their hearts by this story that they were shocked with their life up to this time, reflected, and began with hearty repentance to do penance for it. The hermit, after he had converted the three sinners, lay down to sleep again under the stairs. In the morning, however, they found him dead, and out of the dry wood on which his head lay, three green twigs had grown up on high. Thus the Lord had once more received him into his favour. End of story number 206story number 207 of household tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by theo from hebersham household tales by jacob and willem grimm translated by margaret hunt legend 7 our lady's little glass 
Once upon a time a wagoner's cart, which was heavily laden with wine, had stuck so fast that in spite of all that he could do, he could not get it to move again. Then it chanced that our lady just happened to come by that way when she perceived the poor man's distress. She said to him, I am tired and thirsty. Give me a glass of wine, and I will set thy cart free for thee. Willingly, answered the wagoner, but I have no glass in which I can give thee the wine. Then our lady plucked a little white flower with red stripes, called field bindweed, which looks very like a glass, and gave it to the wagoner. He filled it with wine, and then our lady drank it, and in the selfsame instant the cart was set free, and the wagoner could drive onwards. The little flower is still always called Our Lady's Little Glass. End of story number 207number 208 of Household Titles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Theo from Hebersham. Household Tales by Jacob and Willem Grimm. Translated by Margaret Hunt. Legend 8. The Aged Mother. In a large town there was an old woman who sat in the evening alone in her room, thinking how she had lost her first husband. Then both her children, then one by one, all their relations, and at length that very day her last friend, and now she was quite alone and desolate. She was very sad at heart, and heaviest of all her losses to her was that of her son, and in her pain she blamed God for it. She was still sitting, lost in thought, when all at once she heard the bells ringing for early prayer. She was surprised that she had thus in her sorrow watched through the whole night, and lighted her lantern and went to church. It was already lighted up when she arrived, but not as it usually was with wax candles, but with a dim light. It was also crowded already with people, and all the seats were filled. When the old woman got to her usual place, it also was not empty, but the whole bench was entirely full, and when she looked at the people, they were none other than her dead relations, who were sitting there in their old-fashioned garments, but with pale faces. They neither spoke nor sang, but a soft humming and whispering was heard all over the church. Then an aunt of hers stood up stepped forward and said to the poor old woman, Look there beside the altar, and thou wilt see thy son. The old woman looked there and saw her two children, one hanging on the gallows, the other bound to the wheel. Then said the aunt, Behold, so would it have been with them if they had lived, and if the good God had not taken them to himself, then they were innocent children. The old woman went trembling home, and on her knees thanked God for having dealt with her more kindly than she had been able to understand. And on the third day she lay down and died. End of story number 208